Psalm 8, it's to the chief musician upon Gittith, a psalm of David. Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hast set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this psalm that we're looking at this evening. Just ask, Lord, that as we study it tonight, Lord, I pray that you'll empty me of myself and fill me with yourself, Lord, fill me with your spirit to preach your word tonight. I pray, Lord, that each one here this evening will be made more like thee and that you will see the truths that are here in this text and apply them to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> one of the things about looking at the Psalms is you always want to know, when did he write it? Why did he write it? What was the situation of this song? And uh, you just don't know. You really, for some of them, you, you have it right there for, you know, back in chapter three, it told us what was happening in David's life. It was when he had ran from Absalom, his son, but usually it doesn't tell us what the circumstances were. But this song, we don't know, but many believe that this actually might have been the first of David's Psalms. I don't know if that's true or not, but a man by the name of Henry Hausman writes, and this is from, uh, from the Biblical Illustrator book. He says, in all probability, this Psalm is the first of, or at all events, one of the very first David ever wrote. It breathes the spirit of those lonely nights which he must so often have passed, keeping watch over his father's sheep on the wild hills of Bethlehem. To a lad of his strong poetical temperament, the glory of the Syrian sunset and the gradual assembling of the stars as of an innumerable flock in the silent pastures overhead, the moon like a fair shepherdess walking in her beauty and as night began to wane, the bright and morning star flashing over the hills of Moab must have spoken in a language which he was inspired to understand of the excellence of the great creator of all of the nothingness, yet at the same time, the dignity of man. In after life, how often had he to uh, tune his harp to notes of woe, but its first recorded strains are those of adoring praise. He has this belief that it's the first. I don't know if it's the first or not, but I can see David in this psalm. I call this psalm the song of the son of man. And the son of man in the New Testament, we know in Daniel chapter 7, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Savior, he's the Son of Man. And by the title Son of Man, we understand that he is the one to have dominion. He is the heir of, for, heir of, Adam, uh, heir of the inheritance. But Adam lost, he has redeemed. He is the Son of Man. It all is his. And yet, this psalm reminds me that David is a small, he was a small type of that. A small picture of that. And uh, I, I think of David in this psalm, perhaps this is early on in his life as he's just recently been anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel. And he's there still watching his sheep and he's sitting out under the stars and he's looking up and seeing how great God is and all that God has done and all, that God, all of God's might. And he's there contemplating what God has said about him and his future. And he's thinking, whoa. Really? To think that God would think of me, to think that God would, would crown me, that God would choose me to be king of his people. And as you read this psalm, I, I believe David, 
he has a sense of unworthiness. He's unworthy as he contemplates all that God has done for him. And, you know, that's how all of us ought to feel when we realize who God is and what we are. It's a marvel. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that he, thou visitest him? And so we'll just look at these verses this, morning, this evening and see what David must have been thinking as he lied out under the stars. But number one, I have three points here this evening. And uh, I say that with a smile, three points. You'll see why I'm smiling at the end, I guess. But the first point is the glory of God. Number one, the glory of God. Verse one, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, is glory. And here I see, and first of all, the scope of his glory. His name is excellent in all the earth. His glory is set above the heavens. Think of the glory of God. Think of the excellence of his name. His name is great because of the great things he hath done. In the Old Testament, he delivered Israel out of Egypt and he got himself a name. And uh, originally Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? But at the end of the story, everybody knows who the Lord is. Some believe that this was an early psalm, but written uh, at the time when David fought Goliath. Maybe it was around that time in 1 Samuel. So it's just the next chapter over from chapter 16. But some believe that David maybe wrote it after he fought the Goliath. And well, you remember what happened when he fought Goliath? The Goliath came at him in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, with a sword and a shield. But David came after Goliath in the name of the Lord God of Israel, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And he said that he would deliver Goliath to the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And David slew the giant, and all the earth knew that there is a God in Israel. They saw his glory. But, you know, the greatest testimony to the greatness of God's name is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. His name is exalted. His name is that excellent name in all the earth. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> and keep your finger in Psalm 8 because we'll just read these verses and go back. But Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in, the, in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The name of Jesus... His name is great in all the earth. His name is, is the excellent in all the earth. His name is above every name. But then also as we think of the scope of his glory, back in Psalm 8, it says that he set, thou hast, who has set thy glory above the heavens. And just to note, there's no question mark at the end of that verse. It's just a statement. God set his glory above the heavens. And that's where God's throne is. Did you know that? He set his glory above the heavens. When we talk about heaven, you know, the Bible actually describes three heavens. There are three heavens in scripture. The first one, you wouldn't really consider heaven, but the Bible in Genesis chapter one, verse 14, or verse 20, sorry, 
refers to the area where the birds fly and the airplanes fly and the kites fly. The Bible calls that heaven in Genesis 1.14. So that's the first heaven, the lowest heaven. Then the second heaven is what you think of as heaven. It's outer space. It's the sun and the moon and the stars, Genesis 1.14. It calls that, it says that those are put in the firmament of heaven. That's the second heaven. But did you realize there's a heaven beyond that? There's a third heaven that Paul was caught up to in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and heard words that were not law for, for him to hear. It's in that heaven where you have the throne of God and the tabernacle made without hands and the angels surrounding the throne higher than the heavens. That's where you can see the throne of God, the creator of the universe. What a thought that is. Think of how high God is. Men have been exploring outer space. It's really quite amusing to see them exploring outer space. I think it's cool to see the solar system, but you understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to disprove God in what they're doing. They're sending these things out into space because in their mind, if they can just find life anywhere in this universe, then that proves their theory of evolution. And so they've sent these spaceships all throughout the galaxy trying to prove their religious system. But God is sitting above all that. <laughs> and just looking at them with humor, because he said his, his throne is above the heavens. What a thought. You know, they're, they're, I always was wondered, maybe they could find heaven. Maybe they could find it one day. No, you can't find heaven. You, we used to sing the song. I don't know if I should say I always wondered that. It's not that I always wondered that. I just wondered if it was somewhere in the solar system, but it's not. It's not in the solar system, it's above that as we sang the song to the kids in children's church, no, you can't get to heaven on roller skates. <laughs> You'll roll right past those pearly gates, but you can't get to heaven in an old Ford car. An old Ford car can't drive that far. And uh, there's lots of good verses to that song, but heaven, our, save, our Lord's throne is above the heavens, is what it says here. His glory is above the heavens in Psalm 8 verse 1. So that's the scope of his glory. And then we see the singers of his glory in verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger, the singers of his glories. If it is true that this was written um, by David shortly after fighting Goliath, well then this verse certainly rings true of that. Because what did Goliath say when he saw David coming out to meet him? He disdained him because he was nothing more than a youth. And he said, what am I, a dog? But God lifted up the shepherd boy and gave him the victory over the giant. And out of his mouth perfected the song of praise because of the enemies of God, stilling the enemy and the avenger. When the world saw David kill the giant, only God could get the glory because only God could get credit for what was done. And so it is in our lives. We have the truth in this text that babes and children sing praises to the Lord. Remember when our Savior was in the temple in Matthew chapter 21, the children were running after him singing, Hosanna to the son of David. And the the scribes and Pharisees got upset. They got angry. They said, make them stop. And our Savior said, if they stop, then even the rocks will cry out. And then he said, but didn't you hear how it's written in the Psalms? Thou out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. Matthew 21, verse 26. And the children, they were the singers of his glory. They sung his praise. And so it is in our lives. The fact that we are here today is by the grace of God. And for what God's done in our lives, he gets all the glory. Turn back to the New Testament again, this time to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
illustrates this very well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That no flesh should glory in his presence. The only glory is in God. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. We see the glory of God, the scope of his glory, and the singers of his glory. But then starting in verse 3, verse 3 kind of goes both ways, but I chose to start in verse 3 because the sentence doesn't stop in verse 3. Starting in verse 3, we have the grace of God. The grace of God. Because remember, what's the first four words of the song? O oh Lord, our Lord. That's pretty amazing. This God of all glory has, is our God. He's our Lord. We have a personal relationship with him. And his glory magnifies his grace. That's your blank there. Nothing magnifies God's grace like his glory. His glory magnifies his grace. Um, <clears throat> when you think of the great distinction there is between God and men, when you think of how God is so great and we are so small, then it's even more amazing that he is gracious to us. And so th three things here. First of all, we see the grace of God in that he would acknowledge man, that he would acknowledge man or he would be mindful of man. Verse 3, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Some have called this song the song of the astronomer. Because here David is, he's out on a starry night. He's looking up into the skies and seeing the stars God's creation, God's handiwork, a great display of his greatness, glory, and power. He made the stars. And by the way, it wasn't that difficult. It really wasn't. It's his handiwork. Here in the text, it says that it's the work of his fingers. It's his little fingers were able to do it. The, the one that you're most impressed with, the North Star, he just put it there with his pinky, you know. <laughs> it really wasn't that difficult. In Genesis chapter 1, it's like it's an afterthought. He made the stars also. Yeah, by the way, I, yeah, I made those too. Just in case you were wondering how they got there, I did that. And uh, David's just looking out under the stars, looking out at God's solar system that he's created and he's just amazed at how big God is, how strong God is, how mighty, how great, how amazing God is. And then he begins to feel really small. And he starts to realize how insignificant he is, how little he is. What is man that thou art mindful of him? What is, what is man that you'd even acknowledge us. In this psalm, we're reminded of our sinful condition. When it uses the word man here, it's actually the same for the word Enos. You know who Enos was? Enos is Adam and Eve's grandson. Seth's son was Enos. It was when Enos was born that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Why did they start calling on the name of the Lord? Well, some believe it's they realized how much they need him. Because the name Enos means mortal or frail. It was a, he was maybe something wrong, some health problems that he had or something. But it's the ideal of a mortal man. What is mortal man that thou art mindful of him? 
Think of it. Man is, what, what is mortal man? Man was created by God without fault in God's image, sinless, perfect. But man sinned and came short of the glory of God. He went astray. He chose the path of sin, the path of destruction, the path that leads to death. And yet God is so mindful of him. God could have just forgotten about man. God could have just said, that's enough. We were in our family devotions today. We were reading Genesis chapter 3. And uh, God, what's the first thing God did after Adam and Eve sinned? He came looking. He came looking. He came into the garden. He said, Adam, where art thou? Adam, Adam, I, I, I'm wondering where you are. Adam was hiding from God. God could have just forgotten about him. He could have said that, that plan didn't turn out. That, didn't go, that creation didn't go according to plan. But he didn't. He came searching. And David says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Then it says, what is the son of man? The son of man, that's another name, man. Man there is Adam. It's, uh, the name Adam just means man. And uh, what is the son of Adam, the son of man, that thou art mindful of him? Just talking about, this is talking about man, not when man was created in Genesis 1.26, when he was perfect and without sin. This is talking about fallen man. This is man in his sin. Man that has rebelled against God. Why would you acknowledge Adam's children? Why would you acknowledge his descendants? It's only by grace. God in his grace has acknowledged sinful man. And David here is marveling at the grace of God that he would acknowledge man. But then he does more than acknowledge him. Secondly, the grace of God is seen in that he would visit man. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? Now, when you think of God visiting in the Bible, it can go two different ways. There is a sense in the Bible where God will visit in judgment, and he warns of that to, at various times. But in this passage, it's not referring to God visiting in judgment, but it's about God visiting in grace. It's, it's like how he visited in Naomi's day, in the time of famine, when she heard in the land of Moab, that God had visited his people with bread. It's like when he visited Sarah and gave her Isaac. It's like when Joseph prophesied to his brethren, the Lord God shall visit you and then bring up my bones from Egypt. And so the greatest example in the Bible of God visiting his people is when he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our savior. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, I don't normally get you to turn so much. I'm sorry, I'm guessing in the mood to make you flip tonight. But Luke chapter 1, verse 68, we'll see this word again here in the New Testament. This is Zechariah speaking in Luke chapter 1, verse 68. When his mouth is finally opened and he's able to speak, the first words he says in Luke chapter 1, verse 68 is, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Think of that. To visit in the Bible is more than just stopping by and saying hi. To visit in the Bible is more than just going to your mother's and eating all the food in her fridge. To visit in the Bible is to go and meet someone's needs. It's to go and, and, and make sure that they're taken care of. And so what God did for us is he visited us by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone said if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a savior. He came to meet our need. He visited us to redeem us, to save us. That's the grace of God. Not only does God think of us, 
but he sent his son to be our savior. I wonder, David's just marveling here in this psalm. What's going on here? I'm looking up at the stars and I, I see the greatness of God. I see how glorious he is and I compare that to myself and I realize how far short I fall. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? But he does more than that. You know, that, that would have been sufficient, we would say, because, you know, that, that saves us. We, we, we got out of hell. We were saved from our sins. He sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, and he's visited us. He's met our needs. But in verse 5 to 8, we're reminded he takes it another step further. What is man? What, we see the grace of God thirdly here, that he would glorify us that he would glorify man. Back in Psalm chapter 8, verse number 5. I tell you all to keep your finger there, and I don't keep mine there. Psalm 8, verse 5. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. Think of that. He's made, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. You know, the evolutionist, Darwin, he views man as just barely above the animals, if that high. But our Bible tells us man's just a little, or Darwin says a little above the animal, sorry, if that high. But our Bible says just a little below the angels. Very different sphere, much more value that God puts on a man than the world's teaching. And then it says he's crowned him with glory and honor. And by the way, he's a little lower than the angels right now. But one day man will have dominion over the angels. They're ministers to the heirs of salvation. Well, then it says he's crowned him with glory and honor and given dominion to him of all the works of his hands. And uh, in a sense, you could say this has been fulfilled in that Romans chapter 8 says, them he also called them, he also glorified. But Hebrews chapter 2 reminds us, we don't see this one right now, do we? We don't see this one fulfilled. Uh, you read this and you say, really, David, where do you, I mean, I get it in David's position. He was king, I guess. He had dominion, but when it comes to reality, our lives, we, we don't see this as the case. But turn to Hebrews chapter 2. One last time to turn, I think. Hebrews chapter 2. And we saw this earlier in our series on Hebrews on a Sunday morning. But Hebrews chapter 2, listen to what it says. We say, where's the fulfillment of this? Well, Hebrews 2 verse 5 tells us, For unto the angels he hath not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, this is David in Psalm 8, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. We don't see it right now. We don't see this fulfilled right now. But verse number nine we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Verse number 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. But we see Jesus. We look at it and we say back in Psalm chapter five, we say, or chapter eight, 
We say, but it hasn't happened yet. I don't see how this has happened yet. I, I don't see the fulfillment of this. No, but there's one man that fits the description. There's one man that has already fulfilled this. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was made lower than the angels when he suffered death, when he died on the cross for our sins. Though he was in the form of God, he made himself of no reputation and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was made lower than the angels, but God's exalted him and crowned him with glory and honor and has put under his feet the world to come. He is the son of man. He's the second Adam. He is the rightful heir to all that Adam's lost. We say it's all lost. It's all gone. We, Adam lost in the fall. We can't get it back. That's why John is weeping in Revelation chapter 5 because he looks around and he says, there's no man that's worthy. There's none that's able to reclaim what was lost. Who is able to redeem the inheritance? But Jesus is. But we see Jesus in the John, Revelation chapter 5, no man is found in heaven or in earth or above the earth or below the earth that's able to open the book and loose the seals. But there's one in the throne. There's one right there in the presence of God at the Father's right hand. The Lamb that was slain, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's already crowned in glory at the Father's right hand. And the emphasis of Hebrews and the emphasis here is that we'll get to share in this glory. He's the captain of our salvation and he leads many sons onto glory. The glory that is prophesied of Christ, this glory that he is crowned with, this glory and honor, we get to be partakers of it. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are inheritors of his glory. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that the suffering of this present time is nothing to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And all throughout the Bible, but especially through the New Testament, the emphasis is that we get to share in his glory. 1 Corinthians says that the, the suffering of this present time worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. And we don't deserve it. We're so unworthy. But God in his mercy loved us and didn't just save us, but he sat us up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We don't deserve it. We're unworthy. But God is so good. He's so gracious to us. And David's just marveling at the fact that not only would he acknowledge man and visit man, but that he would glorify man. Well, I said there's three points, and I said it with a smile. You know why I said it with a smile? Because we have the glory of God. Then we have the grace of God. And number three, we have the glory of God again. <laughs> You say, but we already had that point. Yes, well, we already had that verse. <laughs> verse number nine is the exact same sentence that opened the chapter. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And I just want to say this. Yes, we've, we've seen this before, but nothing magnifies, we said already, nothing magnifies God's grace like his glory. Nothing magnifies God's glory like his grace. We are impressed by God because of the great works that he's done with creation and all the different aspects of that and looking out at the stars and we get awed by his creation and his glory. But the greatest evidence of his glory is his grace, that he, the great God, would love sinners like you and me. That's glorious. Though, oh, glorious love, the boss is saying the other day. That's glorious when we think of the love of God for us. And, uh, you know, I think of how in Proverbs 19.11, it tells us it's the glory of a man to pass over a transgression. Well, if that's the glory of a man to pass over a transgression, just think of the glory of God. When all my sins, 
all that I've done, he's cast them behind his back. He's washed them in his precious blood. He's forgotten them. He's removed them as far from me, as far as the east is from the west, and forgiven me. His grace magnifies his glory. In, 19, in 1886, sorry, um, it was a, it was 1885, sorry, uh, there was a man named Carl Boberg, Carl Boberg, and he uh, would later become a member of the Swedish parliament, I guess, in 1912. But um, in 1885, in the time of the year when everything seemed to be in its richest colors, he walked, he was, he, and the birds were singing in trees and wherever they could find a perch. And on one particular afternoon, him and some friends had gone to Kronoback where they had participated in an afternoon service. And as they were returning, a thunderstorm began to appear on the horizon. They hurried for shelter and there were loud claps of thunder and the lightning flashed across the sky and strong winds swept over the meadows and billowing fields of grain. And the storm was soon over and the clear sky appeared uh, there appeared a beautiful rainbow, and uh, the church bells were playing, and he went home, and his window was open toward the sea, and uh, he wrote a poem that in Sweden is called, O Store Good, but in English it's How Great Thou Art. And he wrote that song, and the first two verses, all about creation. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder behold the world that thou hast made, as he views all those things, he says, uh, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. But then it's the third verse where he really hits the point. He says, and when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. I think that fits David in this song. He's thinking of the stars, God is great. But then he thinks of his love and he has to say it again. God is great. How amazing God is that he would love sinners like us. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this time that we've had in your word this morning, this evening. And we've thought of this encouraging psalm, the song of the Son of Man, where we see your love for us and your plan for us and your goodness to us. And even though you're so great and we're so small, yet you've saved us by your grace and have a wonderful promises for us, a wonderful plan for us. I pray if there's someone here tonight that doesn't know you as their Savior, pray that that one will be saved today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.